Broadcasting from the Annie Up studio, it's the longest running poker podcast for the everyday poker player with your host, Joe Scale. Hello, A team. It's Friday, April 28th. I cannot believe we are at the end of April already, but that means the May issue of the magazine will be out soon. So if you haven't seen the April edition yet, go to AnnieUpMagazine.com and click on magazine. The response to the new look with audio and video in there has been awesome. This week for the How You Run In segment, I'm joined by four-time WPT champ, Darren Elias. He talks about his role on the Dreamers documentary, and I am so glad he took the time to talk with me for a bit. I'll have a link to the Dreamers documentary in the description if you want to check that out. Also, if you haven't already, check out our social media pages, especially Facebook and Instagram, because there is a lot on there from our travels in Schenectady and Chicago. That's all I really have, so let's get on with the show. Find out what conversations are happening around the poker table with Table Talk. All right, I'm sitting around the poker table with L. We just wanted to recap the trip we just got back from. Of course, we were out there in New York, and then we went to Chicago, then it was back to New York. So what'd you think? We're exhausted. (laughs) That's what I think. We're exhausted. But it's that good exhausted because we know that we learned so much. We really enjoyed meeting a lot of new people and supporting excellent causes. And so it's that good, good feeling of being tired. Absolutely. Speaking of good causes, though, let's start in Chicago. I know we we actually started our trip in New York, but let's let's talk a little bit about Chicago. What was your favorite part of Chicago? Outside of the Camp One Step event food. You know me, I'm a big lover of travel and trying new food. For the first time in probably five years, I had true Mediterranean experience outside of the Mediterranean. That was amazing. Also, just finding hole-in-the-wall speakeasies, if we could say that. We found just some really interesting places in River North section of Chicago and had great experience with that. So it was refreshing to have new and exciting food. Absolutely. Yeah, the food was incredible. It was funny. I talked to Patrick during the hand of the week. We went to New York and we went to... Chicago, which are known for their pizza. Oh my God, we never we ate pizza. We never had pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about it until you just said it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry, New York. Sorry, Chicago. Next time. Next time. Absolutely. I will tell you my least favorite part was the traffic. Gross. The traffic was awful. 25 minutes to go a mile, guys. 25 minutes. They've shut down parts of their interstates. They just have insane amount of traffic during certain times of day. You couldn't even get a bus on time. So we love you, Chicago, but the traffic, we don't envy that. We don't miss it. Yeah. We will plan better next time. (laughs) Yeah, that was, that was awful. But Camp One Step was incredible. Yeah. What an event. Bravo to both Paige and Hannah. Excellent job at the event space. The way you laid everything out, you made it easy for participants to really come in and enjoy the evening. I thought uh, the grand event space where we had how many tables? Over 20 tables were packed. It was full. The energy was exciting. Even folks who were just there to be observers had a good time. They had a wine toss, the prizes that they gave away, the way that they engaged folks that may not have been playing at the poker table was nice as well. Um, Made it easy for people to get food and drink. You guys had an incredible bourbon tasting, which mad shout out to that gentleman. I wish I knew his name, but your bourbon was excellent and um, separated the high roller tables from the general entry, which I thought was really nicely done as well. Uh, overall, 10 out of 10, we can't wait. Tell us when it's next so we can put it on the calendar. 
Yeah. And they raised $135,000. Which we should have started with that because that's really the most important thing to note from the entire evening. That means 135 children with cancer get to attend camp. That doesn't mean that only 135 people are impacted by this. That means their families, their friends, their siblings are able to see a child with cancer get excited to go to camp. I get goosebumps. I'm shaky just thinking about it. Knowing that impact makes the whole evening and planning process worth it and something to celebrate. Absolutely. And then to kind of wrap all that up, congratulations to Elvie, who won first place and he's going to be going to the WSOP to play. We're going to keep in touch with him, you know, kind of kind of document his series adventure. So that was Camp One. It was it was just the whole thing was so fun. It was great to mix and mingle with the players too. You know, I I spent a lot of time playing, so I didn't get to, you know, during that point, but beforehand and after I did, and it was so fun. And we'll have Jeff on a little bit later and, and kind of recap the whole series and talk about some other things that they have going on as well. But well run, good job. So from there, we went back to New York. So impressions of Schenectady, New York. Schenectady, New York. Unfortunately, it was pretty rainy and cloudy most of the time, so I didn't get out to explore as much. But the food there was also really interesting. We found a couple little dive restaurants that we really enjoyed meeting folks that had been working there for 20, 30 years. Yeah. So I know this is about poker, but I got to eat New Zealand mussels, which were enormous Fantastic, delicious. Um, That's not why I'm going on these trips, though. Really and truly (laughs) got to meet some incredible people at Rivers Schenectady. That This is their home poker room. And that's what I really enjoyed the most about Schenectady was meeting the people, connecting with them, letting them know who we are, what we do, and um, seeing the interaction grow throughout the week. It was really exciting to watch tournaments over time, to see how many bullets people fired, what the end result was, what they were taking away and learning. We really got to see people learning as the week went on as, what do I need to do with my game and how can I improve? And folks were going back for rebuys and going further in the tournament and just the dynamic of a tournament is fascinating to me. So Yeah. And because it was not the best weather, you were inside a little bit, so you got to play a little blackjack. Oh, that triple my, <laughs> triple my money, and then lost it all two days later. Because <laughs> that's the way it goes. Yeah, we also we also got to see a band there at Rivers. Ten most wanted, excellent. They have a horn section. Check them out if you're ever close to Rivers Schenectady or in Schenectady. Yeah, Fantastic they- group. That was just another positive of Rivers is they have lots of really great spaces within their casino. They have an incredible sports betting lounge. They have a stage. You don't even hear that throughout the casino. So you would think a live band in a casino would be a problem. Absolutely not. The steakhouse, delicious, fantastic. Yeah. The, the, the hotel and the casino, both it's a non-smoking facility. So I thought that that was it, it helps make it, I, I don't know, it's just brighter. It was a good atmosphere it, overall. Agreed. Um, and the staff running the tournament too cannot give Elliot and Thomas enough shout outs. And also all of the dealers that were new to Rivers, well done. Excellent yeah. job. Security team, thank you so much. Everything went very, very well. Just in general, everyone we interacted with was kind and polite and very helpful. Yeah, by the time we left, the security team knew us pretty well. <laughs> Not because we did anything wrong, just because we we're we're always carrying backpacks and stuff with our equipment. They always had to check those out. But uh, but yeah, uh, they were super nice. Our room was great when we came back from Chicago. We got a room that was overlooking the river, which was beautiful. Um, again, the weather wasn't the best, but it's still nice to have a little view. So that was nice. But the poker room is really nice, even though when we left, they just replaced the carpet in there. And so I'm sure it looks even nicer now. Yeah, that's another thing. I just think the layout of their casino is pretty exceptional. The poker room's 
private, but you also could see inside so you could see the action, but it's, it's still nicely separated from the noise of the machines. That's something that always overwhelms me, but I really found that when you were in the poker room, you couldn't hear the sounds right. of the overall casino. And so that really helped maintain your focus and purpose in, in what you were doing. Yeah. So you can concentrate a little bit more on... I feel like that helps the players. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So overall, the trip to both, phenomenal. Biggest... Lots of road trip bonding for Joe and I. <laughs> lots and lots of togetherness that we yeah. learned from. Just can we speak from that perspective too? It was good. It was good. Although she did take some time to get away. She's like, I'm just, I'm going to go sit in the car for a while. <laughs> it's okay. Timeouts are good. I yeah. put myself in timeout. Timeout is good for everyone. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was good. Overall, 10 out of 10 experience in the last week. Rivers Casino, New York. Thank you so much for your hospitality. Camp One Step, please get us your date because we want to put it on our calendar for next year. 10 out of 10 experience there as well. Cannot wait to see you guys again. Absolutely. All right. That's our that's a wrap on Table Talk this week. It was a great opportunity for Elle and I to be able to wrap up our trip. Thanks for letting me join in again. Now it's time for Call the Floor with Elliot Schechter. Elliot Schechter is the poker room manager for Rivers Casino in Schenectady, New York. He joins us each week to say how he would rule on situations that come up in your games, and he is with me again this week. Elliot. Hello. How's it going? Uh, The event is over. Finally, uh, my days of rest. Yeah. Well, congratulations, first of all, on the, the Electric City Poker Series. It was a great series. I know I've said this to you personally already, but I just want to put it on the podcast as well. Well run, great staff, just overall, it was a great series. But uh, let's talk about some of the numbers. It was what, 11 events? Yes, 11 trophy events. Yeah. And a whole bunch of days, 11 days, 11 events. Yeah. It was pretty strong. Uh, So across the tournament, we had cumulatively 1,747 total entries into 11 events. Nice. Uh, Those are... Those entries were made by 578 unique individual players All who right. came from 15 states and Quebec province, as far <laughs> away as uh, Arizona, Florida, and New Mexico. Wow. And 184 unique zip codes, home addresses. So we reached from far and wide. It was good to see. <laughs> A lot of people I didn't recognize. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. The total cumulative prize pool for the 11 events was $501,000. <laughs> Which crushed every single guarantee, I believe, too. The guarantee total was 290 Yeah. Unbelievable. Absolutely. And we got a lot of good feedback on some of the creative stuff. The Revival, especially, had excellent feedback. Yeah. Everybody loved it. it. Popular. I I thought it was great. I, that was a fun event for sure. How about that? Uh, the mystery bounty. Mister Browning was exciting. We had enough people in there to have a, a pretty juicy mystery bounty pool. We had a a ten k bounty, which went pretty early, but didn't discourage anybody. We had two five k bounties, uh, several twenty five, several fifteen hundreds, uh, a whole bunch of thousands and five hundreds, and uh, the minimum bounty was a hundred dollars, which is still pretty strong. And then. Uh, four of those minimum bounties uh, got the pick again. Oh, nice. Absolutely. It was very fun. Exciting the whole time. Every time somebody went to the drum, there was a, a lot of anticipation. <laughs> yeah, everybody, Everybody's watching, trying to see what they pull out. Yeah. Everybody's rooting for the minimum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I know, you know, everybody that I had the fortune to talk to, you know, everybody said that they really enjoyed the events too, so... Uh, like you said, the feedback was great. So congratulations again. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel we did very well, and, and I'm so proud of my team. They really uh, showed up for, for this event. Yeah, it, they did a great job. Well, let's let's jump into this hand of the week because this is an interesting one. It certainly is. <laughs> this call the floor is sent in by James Winter. 
And he says he's playing in a bar league tournament. Blinds are 500 a thousand. Under the gun shoves for his remaining stack. It folds to the big blind who calls. When they go to turn their cards over, the big blind only has one card. He insists he didn't muck the second card and no one else at the table saw him muck anything. However, they check the muck and there's an odd number meaning somehow his other card got mucked. The dealer calls the tournament director, and even though the big blind says his other card was a black king and there is one in the muck, the tournament director says there's no way to know if he actually had the card or if he just guessed. He determines they have to play out the hand with the big blind only having one card. The big blind ends up winning the hand anyway, But all of our Googling couldn't find out if that was actually the right call. Would this be a dead hand? Should he have been forced to play with one card? And should the other card have been retrieved since he was able to identify it? (laughs) Well, an interesting sticky situation, which will definitely show up in bar league play, simply because there's obviously no surveillance. And... Uh, people are drinking and certainly not protecting their hand the way they would at a casino table. Sure. Well, let's let's start with the first question. Would this be a dead hand? The answer is yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it is standard in casinos and in poker. A hand with too few or too many cards is not eligible to win the pot and must be declared dead. Right. This one had too few. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that he wanted to play the one card. We don't give people a choice. <laughs> Otherwise, the rules become mere suggestions. Right. Uh, he was supposed to have two cards. He didn't have two cards. One made it to the muck. And I'm going to give these people credit. It was inadvertent. Nobody intended for that card to be in the muck. Right. But we don't have to uh, rule on intent. <laughs> the intent was not to defraud. The intent was to play the hand. That being said, you still got to protect your your interest in the pot. You, you played a hand that wasn't eligible. Now... The big blind in this instance didn't make the bet. They didn't attempt to win the pot. They attempted to call the bet. Right. So they should not have been allowed to play one card, but they also shouldn't lose all their money. Under the gun shove is supposed to win the hand here. The big blind has an ineligible hand. Too much action is passed to declare a misdeal, and too much action is passed to give them a refund of the blind, which you wouldn't do anyway. The big blind is ineligible to play after the action has started, therefore hasn't called the all-in bet yet. Ideally, his hand would be declared dead. His big blind would be surrendered to the pot and obviously to the winner of the hand under the gun. That's not what happened here. The big blind was allowed to play one card. The one card beat the under the gun players two cards. Well, hey, everybody gets lucky. (laughs) And those rules are in place for very good reason. Absolutely. In the past, uh, poker games in, in a lot of places were dealt by hand by the players. And even when they finally moved to to dealer games, the dealers didn't have shuffle machines. So who are you going to trust? Uh, no one. <laughs> a hand with too few cards generally meant that a guy was intentionally getting rid of cards. And that's generally why the rules are in place. In the pre-shuffle machine days, uh, people would hold out cards from other decks and then mix them in and introduce them and have to get rid of the cards. This way, there were always 52 by count. Right. So you may be playing with 52 cards, but you don't know which 52 they are. <laughs> So the, the rules are hard and fast. To protect the game and protect and maintain integrity, for a hand to remain eligible for the pot, it must have the proper amount of cards, which is why it's such a big deal when the cards are turned over in tournaments and cash games. Uh, you don't get you don't just get to show the card that makes the winner. You have to show the entire hand to make sure that not only do you have the ace of spades to if there's four spades on the board to make the flush, you got to make sure that your second card is not also an ace of spades. Yeah. Which is why cards would tend to go missing because they had to duck out the cards so that people wouldn't notice. Uh, I mean, they would be introducing cards, but heaven forbid, one of the cards you're trying to introduce is already matched on the board. Now you got to get rid of that one. (laughs) So that's why the rules are in play to maintain integrity. And certainly it is very likely that that was not the case at all here. Then got mucked by accident. Somebody swept cards into the muck and, and took one of his by accident. Which goes back to the primary rule, he wasn't protecting his hand. Right. And in these bar leagues and, and whatnot, 
it's one thing because, you know, you want them to come, you want them to have fun, you want them to take part in all the drink specials and, and all that. And so the rules get a little lax probably in things like this. And that's why you end up having a situation where you're playing with one card. Right. But it's it. I get torn on these things because while I want somebody to go and have fun and all, it's a slippery slope when you start just kind of making up your own rules. <laughs> there are rules that must be enforced and hand protection is certainly one of them. Right. If nobody's hand is protected, I mean, eventually you're going to have nobody to push a pop to. Right. Yeah. They, there has to be some semblance of order. And one of the things that will help maintain order is everybody protecting their hand. This way, everybody is protected. And this way, the rightful winner of the pot will actually get the chips every time. Yeah. James, that's, I'm glad that you sent that in because it's, it's a, a interesting situation, but uh, yeah, that there's, there should never be a situation where somebody's playing with, with one card for sure. It's virtually never allowed. Yeah. In in all the years that I've ever played, I've never seen a situation like that where somebody played with one card and then to see them be the one that scoops the pot. is a head scratch. Right? Yeah. We didn't answer his last question. Should the other card have been retrieved since he was able to name it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly not. In most cases, especially in the pre-shuffle machine days, you're giving everybody a free shot at guessing a card. Right. I mean, what if their card was awful and now they're just guessing a card that might be in the muck that might make their hand even better? Sure. You can't take that risk. Well, once a card's dead and, and not identifiable and retrievable, it's never coming out of the muck. Right. So it doesn't matter what the, the player said his card was. And, and I'm glad it was in the muck, and I'm glad it proves that there was uh, no ill will or uh, malicious intent here. Well, and he wasn't even really that specific in that case, or at least according to the to what they sent in. He said a black king. Yeah, like... <laughs> well, yes, exactly. And, and some tournament directors and, and supervisors will put the cards off to the side and, and let the, the player whisper in their ear what they were. And it's like, it's tough. <laughs> Once again, you're giving a guy a shot to guess two really good cards. Yeah. If they're mixed into a point where they're not retrievable and identifiable, then they're not coming back. Right. And to your point, an excellent point. He didn't know what the card was. Yeah. He had an idea of what the card was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And so that would have been what strike two or strike three right there if they'd have retrieved that from the muck. So, yes. Actually, I'm not even sure which one's worse <laughs> having him play with, with one card or retrieving that one and letting it go on. <laughs> retrieving the card is worse. Yeah. Letting it play one card, obviously that card was dealt to him. Yeah, that's a good point. So in a bar league, I mean, shoot, I mean, the bar is encouraging people to order drinks. If people are ordering drinks and looking away from the game, it's hard to protect your hand. Yeah. So I see how these things happen. So playing the one card is not the best solution, but it's not worse than pulling a a random card out of the muck and giving it to him. Say, hey, why don't you play this nice one? (laughs) That's fair. (laughs) Yeah. Well, James, again, Thanks for sending that in. That was that's super interesting. Absolutely. Promoted a really good conversation. I appreciate it. James. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you have a hand of the week that you would like to send in, send it to podcast at anyupmagazine dot com. Elliot, we'll talk again next week. Definitely looking forward to it. Appreciate you every week. Glad to do it. Let's break it down with hand of the week. All right, let's break down a hand of the week this week. Patrick, you ready for this one? We are back. Yeah, I'm ready. Lay it on me. What uh, what do we got? Well, we're going to do things a little bit different because this is my own hand this week. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> All right. No, no pressure from the gallery here. All right. Uh, yeah, so we played the main event up in uh, Schenectady, and this is a hand from that tournament. It's It's a super interesting hand. And so I just thought it would be fun to run this one through. I like it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Let's see how the uh, the, the, the amateurs do over here compared <laughs> to you guys. Well, at the point of this hand, we have 18,000 in chips. Okay. The blinds are 300, 600, 600. So 300, 600 with a 600 big blind ante. We started the tournament with 30,000 in chips. And like I said, we've got 18,000 now. Okay. So down a little bit, 300, 600, 600 ante. All right. We start the hand, the under the gun. So first play, first person to act raises to 2,400. 
True. Uh, so four times the big blind. Yep. Middle position calls. Okay. We're in the big blind with the deuce of hearts, four of hearts. Okay. What are you going to do with that? Two of hearts, four of hearts. So for everyone else out there similar to me, so 680, I've already put in everybody else's. Um, so to, to call um, is what another 1800 for myself, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to go ahead and call that. Right. Two did, two four. Yeah, that's uh, that's good enough for me to at least make a call and go from there. Okay. That's what I did too. Okay. I'm uh, feeling good so far. We're agreeing with who we're agreeing with. <laughs> the smart guys. <laughs> the flop comes out a dream. We've got the three of hearts, the five of diamonds, jack of hearts. There's all right. 7,500 in the pot. Well, we've got, we've got, we've got flush draw. We've got straight draw. Um, so first to act. So the under the gun definitely pushed the limit on that one. I am probably going to, I would say it's still going to be smaller than him. It'd probably be half of that. I'd probably go 1200 and then kind of gauge the rest of the table. You know, I, I feel good about my hand, but we'll kind of see how everyone else is, is feeling after that. So I go 1200. Right. So two times. Right. So you're, you're, you're betting, you're betting 1200 into 7,500. Yep. And I checked. Okay. I checked mainly thinking I don't know what I could really be representing here other than what I have, right? I'm kind of if I I felt like if I was betting, I'm kind of saying, okay, I've got a straight draw or I've got a flush draw. Yeah. So I wanted to go with a little bit of deception, so I check. So you check with the idea that you want someone else to do that instead, correct? Yeah, that, that yeah. being the idea. Okay. Yeah. I'm fine. Under the gun, under the gun, and and this is information I should have given to. Under the gun had been pretty loose. He had been getting mixed up in a lot of pots, playing a lot of hands. So so I I felt like he was probably going to push the action a little bit more too. Okay. So there's there's where we are. All right. So you checked what did under the gun do in this position? Under the gun, bet 3,000. Okay. The middle position folds, and that's up to you. Well, I was obviously willing to bet already. Um, I think with two great draws there, I mean, you have a ton of cards that are possibilities. I feel like I call there. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I did. I called. Sweet. Okay. The turn is the ace of clubs. So now you're good. Now you've got it. Yeah. Now we have the nuts. Um, with 13,500 in the pot, what are you going to do? I'm probably going to bet again. I would, uh, if I were to do it, I would have upped it a little bit. I probably would have doubled my bet. So to 2,400. So that would have pushed the you know pot to like 15 and change. But knowing you, I'm assuming, did you check again? <laughs> I, I did not. Okay. And here's the reason. I'm thinking the the villain in this hand, I'm thinking he probably has an ace of some sort. So I think I can get him to to push the action a little bit more. Gotcha. So okay. he's going to be calling wide or maybe even raise me, right? Which if he raises me is the dream, right? So right. I, I bet 5,000. Oof. Okay. I like it. Under the gun calls. Beautiful. The river... Is the nine of hearts? Oof, not what you wanted to see. <laughs> yeah, not what you wanted to see at all because you're a low, low flush. Yeah, exactly. If, yeah, if he's chasing the flush, it's definitely better than mine. It is definitely yeah. If he was, he's definitely got you there. Yeah, see that one's tough. If I'm if I'm playing my the my hand hypothetically, you know, I bet the twelve hundred, then I bet the twenty four, and then I see a a heart come out. I mean, I'm probably telling him that I either A, don't have a flush, or B, I had something else, whether it's the straight or, you know, trip something up or whatever it was. But I'm probably telling him by calling or by checking that I don't have as much as him, but I would probably check here. Knowing that he's going to okay. push the action, I probably would check just to kind of save myself or, and you know, at least see what's what. So what, um, what did you end up doing? So... I've only got like 7,600 left in my stack at this point. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, I've got two of the, two of the outs that he could have for the flush, right? 
Right. So I feel sure if if I check, he bets no matter what he has. Yeah. And I want to be the one pushing the action. So I put in my last 7,600. Oof. I like it. He snap called me with the ace of hearts, king of hearts. Oh, God. Just the absolute, <laughs> the absolute worst nightmare from what you were thinking. Yeah. Oh, and man, that's that, a tough beat. Yeah, that's how we bust the main event. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a. I mean, that's a tough one. Yeah, that's, that's a tough way to end it right there. So, I mean, I look at this, you know, and and obviously as as I do when anytime I'm playing a tournament, I analyzed, reanalyzed, and put it into poker odds calculators and checked every scenario i deuce four out of position maybe that's a mistake um put you know for 2400 putting in another 1800 i that could be a mistake i think it's borderline i don't think it's a a huge mistake but it, it could be because i'm out of position yeah uh it's it's not egregious by any means but it's definitely it, it's definitely on that borderline from there, the hand kind of plays itself as it is because of what we were holding, right? I, right. I, I don't think at any point he's folding. I don't think there's anything I can do different to get him off of Ace King of Hearts. He flops the world too, right? Right, yeah. I mean, once once you're I mean, at that point, once you're both in, I, I don't see of any way of you getting him out. Not with right. the cards that ended up falling. I mean, there's no way, no amount of money or how you play it or whatever. I mean, he's in. And you already said that he was already playing a lot of pots anyways, let alone, you know, he's got ace, ace, what you say, ace king of hearts and he flops two hearts. Yeah. Sure, he's he's playing the, the rest yeah. of the way. So then it comes into a calculation of, you know, at some point, should you have left? I, that's tough. I, I mean, on the turn of you, I don't think on the do. turn. Uh, yeah, on the turn, I've got the nuts. There's no way I can fold. No, I've I've got the absolute best hand at that point. But when I when I look at this from a long term profitability, like take the hand that he ends up having, if you take that out of the equation and you think about a range of hands that he could have, then from a long term profitability, I feel like I should probably have shoved on the flop. Because yeah. then I've got then I've got some fold equity. I can get them to to fold some things. So I think if the if I think about it, the way I I if I were to go back and do it again, the way I would have played it would have been check when he bets the three thousand. I shove all in at that point. I got you. You know I've got the straight draw and the flush draw. I've got some fl- fold equity there. I can get him to fold some hands. Unfortunately, Ace King of Hearts is not one of those that would fold, but that would uh, yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> that would have been a real tough fold for that guy at that point. Let me ask you this question hypothetically. What if you push it hard when it comes back to you before the flop? How do you think that could have played out? I mean, that's a uh, tough you wouldn't have done it. Let me put it this way you wouldn't have done it with two four, but I mean if you did, I wonder how that, you know. Yeah, I don't think he's I, in this particular case. I still don't think he's going anywhere with Ace King of Hearts. He's yeah. got, yeah, no, he's definitely not. And yeah, at that point, he's just thinking, you know, he either has me dominated or I've got a pair and it's a race, right? But yeah, it's. I don't think there's as it is the hands as they are. There's nothing we can do. The only other way of looking at it is not playing Deuce Four out of position. Yeah, true. So that's the only place in that hand that I think I could have changed the outcome is not playing it. However, like I said, I don't think it's egregious, but I don't I, I don't think I played it well on the flop either. Once the flop comes out, I probably should have gotten the chips in. Uh, on the turn, I definitely should have gotten the chips in. But I, I, And I actually thought, that when I bet the 5,000, I expected him to come over the top thinking, you know, he's got a solid ace. But when he just called, then that heart came out, then uh, daggers. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the main event. I was going to say, what, God, what a way to bust out of the main event on that one. I mean, that's you, you can sit back in Monday morning quarterback that one all the, uh, the, 
for a while and still not get to a point to where you're you're still going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I uh, uh, I needed a minute after that one for sure. I would say so. <laughs> God. Oh man. Well, otherwise, good trip up there. Uh, oh yeah, it was it was fantastic. I'm gonna give a shout out to one of the restaurants up there called Marino's. So good. The food was so good. Marino sounds uh, Italian. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Uh, we everybody says it's the best pizza in town. We didn't actually have pizza, but it was delicious. And then when we were in Chicago, I mean, the food in Chicago was phenomenal as well. Just oh, no doubt. Did you get yeah. yourself a deep dish pizza while you were in Chicago? I did not. I did not eat pizza. On this trip at all. I was in New York and Chicago and did not eat a single slice of pizza. Pizza capitals of the United States and was not eating pizza. I got to tell you, I've had deep dish pizza a handful of times and it is a meal that needs a nap afterwards if you go out. Yeah, That's I bet. For sure. I bet. <laughs> well, I mean, tough one to lose out on. It is, but on to the next one as we do. Yes, we do. There's, there's the next thing coming somewhere. Well, Patrick, I appreciate you breaking it down with me. Absolutely glad to be here. I uh, I feel I feel a little bit better that I uh, you know I just didn't stumble upon too bad on a hand that that you ended up you know <laughs> on as well. So I couldn't have lost that too bad. So, but no, yeah, good to, uh, good to be here, and we'll uh, we'll play another hand. Yep, we'll see you next week. Take care. The question is, how you running? This week in the How You Run In segment, we have a special guest. Darren Elias holds the record for most WPT titles with four. He's amassed over $19 million in poker winnings from online and live tournament caches. He's also part of the Dreamers documentary. You can find that on YouTube, so if you haven't checked it out, definitely do that. But Darren, first of all, thank you for joining me for a little bit here. My first question to everyone in this segment is always, how you running? <laughs> Been running pretty good lately. I was able to win a tournament in Las Vegas during the U.S. Poker Open two or three weeks ago. Um, anytime you're able to just win first place, win a tournament outright, feels good. So can't complain about how I've been running. I uh, was home for a stretch. Now I'm down here in uh, Fort Lauderdale playing the Hard Rock Series, the World Poker Tour, and uh, – Going to play this one, get a little time home, and gear up for the World Series. Hope I keep running well. Nice. Well, congratulations on all that. Um, you, hey, you know, before the documentary actually came out, I was able to talk to Tom Wheaton. He's an incredible gift to, to the poker industry. And, I mean, he's doing some great things with Faded Spade and Above the Felt, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the company that made Dreamers. So, how did you get involved with Tom and and Above the Felt? Sure. I, I knew Tom from, I met him briefly when uh, through the World Poker Tour because they used Faded Spade cards and he was at a final table. So I had a couple handshakes, met him real quick, probably almost seven, eight years ago now. And then uh, I think one night in Vegas, I was eating dinner at uh, Carbone with a friend. I was just at the bar having dinner and uh, Tom had just got knocked out of a tournament and kind of came up to me, Darren, I got knocked out at King Jack. What should I, what should I have done? Like asking me some strategy questions. And uh, we had a couple of drinks, ended up hanging out for an hour or two and uh, got his information. And then when he launched above the felt, um, I was one of the first people he reached out to and um, asked if that, that was something I'd be interested in. And for me, I was interested because, I'm not very good at, at marketing myself or, or business, corporate kind of negotiations, anything like that. I'm, I'm a poker player, and that's where my focus has always been. So to have someone like Tom in your corner who's an expert on that kind of thing has been invaluable. So that, that's kind of how we got started. Uh, yes, yeah, kind of to touch on that, poker players, there's there's kind of two worlds of poker players. There's, there's some that are strictly, I mean, a poker player, and, and that's I just want to go and play my tournaments and, and – uh, then you have the ones that are looking for that spotlight a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You seem like you seem like the type of guy that doesn't necessarily uh, strive to be in that that spotlight all the time. So, what was it like having a camera in your face the whole time when you're playing? Yeah, it was interesting doing this documentary. I guess, yeah, I, I've never been one who wants the spotlight or anything like that. But over the years, it's something that if you have success in poker and major tournaments 
televised final tables, et cetera, interviews, you're, you're going to have to deal with cameras in your face and spotlight sure. and th media, things like that. So I think I've gotten a little better at, with, with it um, throughout the years. And you got to look at the big picture. Um, anytime people want access to you, they, they want to hear what you think about poker and you have a chance to, to grow the game. I think that's good. So, I mean, I, I have embraced it more of late and um, Tom's been, uh, been helpful with that. Nice. And I know we, we talked a little bit. Uh, I know it's hard to, to travel and, and all, especially when you have a family. And so being away, how do you kind of stay focused on the game while you're while you're not at home? I've always found the best way for me to do it. I mean, it's different for everybody who's a dad or uh, has a family and has to play. For me, I really separate it a lot when I'm on a poker trip. I tend to travel alone. I don't bring my family with me and I'm 100 percent focused on poker, playing the tournaments, making the best decisions, studying in between sessions, things like that. And when I'm at home, I'm not doing much poker work and, and I'm focused on being a dad, being a husband, being present with my family. So I really separate it. And then I try to keep the, the trip short. That That's something that's been helpful, too, where around a week, seven, eight, nine days is probably the, the sweet spot where anything longer than that. I start to get homesick. Kids start to miss me, put, puts uh, stress on the family. So that, that are, that's kind of my two, um, I guess, secrets to, to being able to do this um, professionally. Because I, I am gone a lot. I'm probably gone um, half the time or something like that. So so it's it's tough. Yeah. Well, I I think anybody that can, can juggle that, uh, kudos to them because it, it is tough. Mm -hmm. Back to the documentary a little bit, though. The, the show's generated over 70,000 views in a pretty short time. But... Uh, when you watch it, you guys really look like a pretty close group. I know, you know, you're pretty varying group, but uh, would you say that's true? Do you guys hang out? I think it, it it's interesting. We There's a lot of people in the group now, I think maybe like a dozen, a dozen players or something. And like you said, people from all different walks of life, different ages, different levels in their poker career. And um, I would say it, it really depends person to person. Like I've known Berkey for 15, 20 years. Um, some of these people like Rampage, early 20s, I just met last year. I mean, when I started playing poker, he was probably 10 years old. So it's uh, it's interesting, <laughs> but there there is a common theme of like Tom, Tom wants to bring good people into the group. And it, 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 you know, it's always natural, even when he does bring new players into Above the Felt, that everyone seems to get along. Um so hanging out, I think some more than others, and I think it depends on um, which players we're talking about, individual relationships, but it is always fun. We have these uh, group dinners and get together, things like that. Nice. One of the things that I talk about with the Any Up ambassadors, because we have, you know, we have a group across the country. One of the things that we talk about is the growth that we've seen in poker tournaments over the last year to a year and a half. They all seem to be crushing the guarantees for a lot of the tournament series. Do you see that happening at the higher stakes as well, or is it pretty flat there? I think the higher stakes games are good right now, and live poker is thriving everywhere, uh, especially in America. But I think as we see international tournaments too, high roller tournaments, stuff at the Poker Go studio, numbers are good right now. And I think we're still kind of seeing the release of some pent up demand from COVID where people weren't really sure. able to play as much as they wanted to. And there, there weren't as many available tournaments. So people are really um, hyped up to get out there and play live poker. And also I think this kind of burst of like new media and, and new, these influencers like um, brings a new crowd. We get a younger crowd that in, in these um, mid stakes tournaments where uh, nowadays play with a lot of younger kids where I think, Five years ago, maybe that wasn't the case. So um, definitely good to see uh, the state of live poker right now. I'm, I'm bullish on it, I'd say. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you mentioned uh, Rampage earlier. Just, you know, he started out with his videos playing like 1-3, I think. And now he's, you know, playing these these higher stakes. So it's, it's good to see. I mean, you mentioned in the Dreamers documentary, the growth of online poker. Is that because you want to see online poker grow as a whole because you like it or because you see that as a gateway to growing the game as a whole as well? I think online poker is tricky and I'm probably a little biased because um, I came up playing online poker and that was kind of how I, how I learned the game and I have a, a soft spot for online poker and I want people to be able to have that same experience I had, and especially as an American, where since Black Friday 2011, online poker has been a struggle in, in the States. So 
I, I really think there is an opportunity in, in, in the United States market. And I, I'm working with Bet MGM now to, to kind of build that network. And there's still some pieces that need to fall into place, but there's definitely the demand and the foundation is there where if we were able, ever able to get a lot of states and get them linked up, shared liquidity, I think online poker could be great again and um, really have a have a chance to give people the opportunities that, that I had when I was coming up uh, as a young online player. Well, and kind of to that point, you also mentioned in the, the video, you're pretty good at being objective and self-evaluating your play. What does that process look like for you? And I know it's it's different for everybody because the mindset's kind of a tricky thing. Mm-hmm. But how do you suggest that somebody else approach their game uh, when they're trying to get better? It's tough. It really depends player to player. I, I think um, if you're someone like me who's able to be objective and, and self-analyze, I think that's the best route. Always put yourself in your opponent's shoes. Think about how they're going to play different parts of their range and the hand you're thinking about. Think about, am I really ever bluffing here? Like considering all the options with every hand in your range and, and working through it in your head is kind of how I operate. But if that's something that, that doesn't come naturally to you, I would suggest having a, a support group or like other, other players you respect their opinion to, to bounce ideas off of. I think that's helpful. Having other players around that can give you some feedback on hands. And lastly, I would say working with computers and simulations, things like PO Solver, GTO Wizard, whatever it is, to understand the theory of, of how things should work in the game and what it looks like in a computer but taking it with a grain of salt that that's not always going to be what's actually happening in game. Right. That's perfect. I, I, I think that's a great little ending spot to have some advice there. Uh, I appreciate you joining me again. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, good luck at the hard rock today. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. From poker pro to poker coach. Now I am joined by Mark Brimmett, who has been a poker coach for over 15 years He's also been a lead columnist for Annie Up for years as well. Now he's joining me here to talk a little strategy. Mark, how's it been going? Going great. How you doing, Joe? I'm doing well. You know, I just got back earlier this week from playing a little bit of poker, but covering a lot of poker. And, you know, it felt it felt really good to get back into playing a little bit because I haven't been able to play as much as I would like since taking over Annie up, but I had to kick some it was some rust off a little bit, but uh, but got going. It was good. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes when we play too much, our brains become anesthetized, and mm-hmm. well, put it this way: when you're dreaming Ace King, <laughs> you you need to take a break, right? <laughs> Well, we talked a little bit about some poker and uh, we were talking about describing your hands and whatnot. And, and I think that's what I want to talk about this week. Oh, OK. Great. Great. You know, let's let's delve into that a little bit. So when you have someone that's trying to describe a hand to you, I know dealing with it myself, you, you can get kind of lost because... Uh, they can't remember all the facts or they get lost themselves. They start telling it one way and then they're like, no, wait, wait, wait. So how do you combat that with, with your students? Okay. Well, that there, there's a two part answer to this. And um, I just want to talk about poker speak. And when somebody's conveying a hand to me and they just sound a little bit off, call it a poker gut instinct, and they're just a little bit tilty, I really can gauge that their information is going to be incomplete and um, a little bit fuzzy. And, and you know what? That's the description of tilt. Our brain is a little yeah. bit fuzzy, and we start thinking not as clear and our memory goes off. So how we record hands, and this is for cash games and tournament players, um, is essential to reviewing our play and getting better. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the second part of the, the answer is my whole poker regimen is set up with players sharing their hands with me. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I have them share it on email. And it would come in in the subject line, hand number 47. 
Big Blind, 1-3, Venetian, Effective Stack, 300, 4 5 of Hearts. But there's so much information in that heading. Right. Then comes the description of the hand, and it's flawless. I get the exact right about it, information, the way they convey the hand and what they did and what happened. What usually happens when somebody writes in a hand or tells you a hand on the phone or bumps into you in the casino or in the elevator, uh, <laughs> they start telling you a hand, and the next thing you know is they're in uh, the big blind, and then you say, well, wait a minute. And then they say, no, 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 it was on the button. Oh, no, no, it wasn't three players. It was four players. Right. Oh, no, we were heads up, you know. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's just like, believe me. Can't really, but by, by emailing a hand, I can really give you a lot of good information. Absolutely. About yeah. the way you played it and about different ideas about the matter. And sometimes it is, it depends on the player and we can identify that too. Who was the player? Um, that could be in the blurb about the hand underneath all that information. Sure. Like you mean if they're loose, aggressive or, you know, tight, aggressive or, Whatever. Yeah, I think loose, tight, passive, aggressive is a good four square way to uh, pretty much uh, describe a player. Yeah. Yeah. Believe me, you know, people describing a hand, I've had more hands described to me in the last four to five months since taking over Annie Up. Everybody wants to tell me about their poker hands now. <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, when somebody is at a, at a poker table, right? A hand happens and they're like, I, I, I don't know if I played this right. I, I don't know. Do you suggest that, you know, they step away from the table, kind of put it into a notepad on their phone or bring a pad yeah. of paper with them? What, how, what's the best way to right. do that, do you think? You're not going to want to just write down the whole hand in paragraph form and you're going to get it wrong anyway because the hands are going to be in the air and you want to observe tables. But you can pick up your phone hit your notes and just put three key things in what your position was. So you can say SB, what the effective stacks are, which is the lower of the, you know, it's your stack compared to the razor stack. Even if it's three ways, use the razor stack as, as your gauge. So if the razor has 430 and you've got 230 in front of you, the effective stack is 230. Right. And your hand or, you know, the three things will jog your memory later on when it's time to take some notes. Yeah. You'll pretty much convey it accurately. But if you think that you're going to just remember it (laughs) after playing, forget about three hours, four hours, six hours, seven hours, (laughs) you know, it it, it just gets fuzzy. Yeah. A lot of times we forget that we meant to write that one down. But it's such a great habit. I think one hand an hour is plenty of material. Yeah. You're in a cash game and you write down one hand per hour, even if you don't have a coach, even if you go home and review it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, usually whenever I'm trying to remember a hand, if there's one that I, I didn't write anything down or I'm, I'm trying to recall exactly how it is or, or whatever, there's usually, you know, there's a few key things that I will always have to think about, oh, where was I position wise or what the effective stacks were exactly, or, you know, something like that. And what I remember most in a hand may not be the same as what you remember when you play a hand, you may remember the effective stacks just fine, but you know, you forgot one other detail, whatever that is. And so uh, the key things to write down aren't necessarily the, always the same ones, just whatever it's going to take to jog your memory. Right. Exactly. And it's funny because we have 15 minutes on break and it's hard enough to get in and out of the bathroom and get back to your <laughs> you know, poker thing or run upstairs and whatever and come back down. You know, it's hard enough to get back to the table in time. But what you hear in the elevator is this freaking donkey pushed on you. Know, you right. Know, the, instead of like, where do you want your mindset to be? Do you want to be talking about a beat that some guy gave you because you flopped a straight, but he had a set <laughs> and he was so dumb that he pushed all in and he was behind? Well, maybe not. You know, maybe, maybe you would have done the same thing, but you're in this mindset right. where you're just uh, calling people donkeys or fish. I prefer fish. I'm old school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, donkeys happen to be very, very smart animals. You know? Well, that's a fair point. I, I never thought about it that way, but that's a fair point. They have amazing, they have, they have amazing memories. 
So I don't think we should be dissing the dog. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you hear this poker speak that it's, your brain is in the wrong place. What a great thing it would be do, to do is during that 15, 20 minutes that you have is reviewing one or two hands and thinking about getting into that zone where you're thinking about who your competitors are at their table. And man, if you can close your eyes and visualize their stacks, who has what, well, you're in the right zone. If you're testing yourself, you, you're in the right, right zone to make that final right. table. And I think if you can go over a hand and, and think about it differently, that's going to help you not go on tilt as well. So like you said, keeps you in the mi right mindset. Yeah, it, it's sort of like an anti-tilt formula. It's sort of like in baseball, keeping your eye on the right. ball, having a hitting coach tell you what's going on. Um, you know, if you're uh, completely flummoxed, you're probably not going to have a great at right. bat. Well, Mark, I appreciate you talking about this point. And here's what would be fun. Let's go over the subject line one more time. And if anybody wants to go over a hand with you, then uh, then we'll go over a hand with them. How's that? Great. The hand number, the hand itself, the position, the effective stack, and the game. That's in the header. Right. It makes it so much easier for the person who's conveying a hand. Let's take it one step further, Joe. If anybody wants to send a hand, you know, free, I'll respond to it. Okay. If they can meet that criteria. Right. And it's got to be in the subject line. Sounds good, yeah. What happens is when the player has that in the subject line, they can convey the hand below in the email right. really easily. They can send it to you and you could forward it to me. Yeah. So if you guys have a hand, send it to podcast at com, And then, uh, then as long as it meets the criteria – We'll get it over to Mark and he'll break it down and respond to you. Thanks again. We'll talk again next week. It's time for Joe's One Outer. In poker, your greatest asset can also be your greatest weakness. Resilience in poker is a must. You fall down, you have to get up and dust yourself off. But that can also turn into one of your biggest downfalls. If you get up and dust yourself off too quickly and you didn't learn anything, then you're not resilient. You're just a repeat offender. If you keep tripping over the same thing because you never stopped to take inventory of where the thing is that keeps tripping you, then you're going to spend so much time dusting yourself off that you don't have time to even ask yourself, why does this situation keep coming up? Why do I keep tripping in the middle stages of the tournament or on the bubble? Resilience is great. It's necessary, but not at the expense of a little wisdom. Concentrate on the why. Hone in on the why. Because that is where you will see your game grow. That's today's One Outer, and that's today's show. I'll see you next week, A-Team. And until then, I'll see you at the tables. The Any Up Podcast is a production of AnyUpMagazine.com. Contact the show at podcast at AnyUpMagazine.com or call the show at 540-339-7741. If you'd like to advertise, send an email to editor at AnyUpMagazine.com. <laughs>